representing Franchise Secrets, Eric Von Horn. If you're not a part of the Franchise Secrets Facebook group, what are you waiting for? It's FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. I cannot believe how valuable this group turned out to be. When someone asks a question, the feedback is honest, authentic, very helpful, and it's from multiple perspectives. If you're not sure that you're getting the most accurate information about franchising, then check out the largest, most helpful Facebook group in all of franchising. Whether you're a Z, a Zor, a buyer, or investor, join our free Facebook group at FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. Welcome to the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Your host, Eric, here today with Casey Cavell. Now, Casey is a franchisee or has been a franchisee, but he's a serial entrepreneur. He started his first company when he was 21 years old. Since then, he's started, bought, invested, and operated in over two dozen businesses in multiple different industries. After a business he founded was acquired, he became passionate about helping others achieve the same level of success. So he created Legacy 412, which consists of an entrepreneurial team of advisors, mentors, investors, and experts who are called to serve the growth-minded entrepreneur. He's a former college baseball player turned coach who used the game of baseball to reach youth through his baseball academies in Georgia. So, and I've been excited to talk to Casey. He knows a lot about the visionary role, the integrator role. He's done uh, so many things in business and I'm, uh, I just wanna dive into it. But before I dive into it, Casey, what did I miss? And give us a little bit of your story. No, that was fantastic, Eric. Well, great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, I guess serial entrepreneur is what I've been. Uh, typically, I would go in early on in business and buy a company because I could I could see the vision. I could see the things I could fix. And I realized, hey, if I could fix this, that would generate more revenue. Or if I could fix this in a business, that would minimize expenses. And I'm like, if I can maximize revenue and minimize expense, expenses, the business might be worth more money and I could be profitable. And, you know, I just figured out a way to scrape up a few thousand dollars and bought my first business and doubled it in value and flipped it and then just worked my way up. And that's what I've done pretty much my entire career until I exited uh, a multi-unit franchise operation about shoot about five years ago and learned a lot uh, along the way and talking about visionaries and integrators and how those are the two people you need in every business, right? You need that person that has that big idea and that big vision. And they're always looking 12, 24 months in advance, because if you don't have that person, you're not getting those new ideas. You're not figuring out what are the strategic opportunities in this industry. But if you don't have that second person in charge of executing the vision, making sure that long-term wrap you know, vision happens and managing the people and the processes, it's really hard. So I kind of figured out a way to, go from being both a visionary and integrator, the idea guy versus the executor to really just sitting in one seat in the organization because I burn out in businesses because I was doing everything and I realized I had to figure out what was unique to me. And once I figured that out, I surrounded myself with a team that could complement you know, uh, my strengths and allow me to focus on what I do best and then delegate everything that I wasn't strong at, so. So what are you? Are you more visionary or are you more integrator? It's weird. I have both the visionary and the integrator skill set. I'm a really great integrator for any business for about six to 12 months. But then after that, I get bored. So that's where I'm probably more a visionary, but I'm a very detail oriented visionary. Um, you know, I saw, I grew up in a household where my dad was super visionary and he would go and start and do all these things. But I realized, hey, without that integrator, not all of these ideas are actually going to work out. So I was almost like, scared not to be an integrator, but I had like the blood of a visionary. So I made sure every business I had, I was always thinking big, but I always had a plan on how to get there. But when you're in a business for day in, day out, you kind of get over it. So that's where I think I'm more visionary, but I value the integrator. And that's where I've surrounded myself with great integrators in every business um, after that initial startup phase. Well, isn't that one of the keys is for the visionary to value the integrator and the integrator to value the visionary? Sure, absolutely. Because what an integrator right can do, a visionary can't or doesn't want to, and what an integrator can do, right, a visionary shouldn't be doing it. So absolutely, they both bring two separate skill sets and two separate roles to the business, and you need them, and you need each other. And if you can value each other's opinion, you're going to be in great shape. Well, 
a lot of people, I've had Gino Wickman on the podcast. People know, should know, uh, traction and rocket fuel and all of that, but that's really where these terms are coming from. So can you give us a little bit of background on Visionary Integrator and then your connection with all of that? Sure thing, yeah. So so Traction is an operating, a book uh, written about EOS, which is like an operating system. It's like the engine under the, you know, under the hood, right? It's like the thing that every business needs where it organizes your people and your process and your execution. It's just like the way that you can manage people's energy and focus people on what's important. So that's like the structure. Now, the visionary and integrator are the people that are really like doing the stuff, especially the integrator. The integrator is the one driving the car and making sure the car stays on the road, right? The visionary is typically the one that's trying to get the car to go off the road and do crazy things. But the entrepreneurial operating system, which is EOS, is the structure that helps you develop a plan. The integrator is more or less the COO, right? If you looked at like corporate language, chief operating officer, visionary, more CEO, and Mark C. Winters and Gino wrote a great book called Rocket Fuel where it talks about that relationship. And then my involvement was one, I read the book. And then two, I ended up working with uh, Mark as his integrator, helping him scale and build out Rocket Fuel University um, and all of that kind of stuff. So I was the integrator kind of behind Rocket Fuel University and working directly with you know, the author of the book, Rocket Fuel, I learned a whole lot. And we created that kind of dynamic duo where I knew what he was great at. He knew what I was great at. And I worked in my lane and there was really only three things that he did. And I made sure he spent 70, 80% of his time a day doing those three things, because those are the things that grew the business. And then I was the one to manage the people and the processes and all that kind of stuff. Did you uh, so Rocket Fuel is probably my favorite book in in all of that because maybe because I'm a visionary and I could you know it's not as thick or as big as as uh, traction. So, but I love that book. Um, when you were in that role, were you just vision like did you find an integrator into those companies and the and the different things that you were doing? Like, was your role to be a short term integrator, a fractional integrator, and then did you move yourself out of of that? Or how how did that work? Yeah, so I didn't really get this framework or the language behind Visionary Integrator until, gosh, my last year in our franchise. So I was doing all of these things and I didn't really have a name behind it. So if you haven't read Rocket Fuel, read it, like at least just read the first chapter. If you send me an email, I'll email you the first chapter of it because it's that impactful. And then once you read it, it just puts a language to it. So, you know, when I heard about it, I realized I was a visionary but I had to replace myself as an integrator. And in the business we scaled and sold, um, I actually did the integrator role, but it allowed me a 12 month runway to say, okay, I'm more visionary than integrator, but I can do both really well. But I had a 12 month kind of sprint where it's like, okay, I partnered up with a visionary and that person helped find our new locations and negotiate the leases and raise the money that we needed to raise. And my job was just to execute the day-to-day -day. because if I wanted to see our full vision realized, which was five locations throughout the Atlanta area and, you know, a $10 million business, I couldn't be, you know, running and managing the people and the processes and raising money, right. And finding locations and negotiating leases and managing builders and contractors to build out these locations. So I just had to pick which one do I want to be. And we had a 12 month plan and we executed that plan. So, yeah, I think I was a visionary and integrator that realized I just couldn't be in both seats and I could do both well, but longer term, I realized I should be more in that visionary seat. But now I actually help people part-time, short-time, you know, during a short period of time, fill that integrator role to build the team because I get really fueled by really short-term projects to help a visionary get out of the day-to-day because -day. that's what it is. It's like, Visionaries don't need to be, and they don't want to be running the day to day. And the integrator is the person that can get you out of there. And if you have like a system, like an EOS coupled with an integrator and you match both, you're in really good shape. Cause it's hard to find integrators, especially if you're a visionary and you, you know, it, I, at least from what I've seen in entrepreneurial friends of mine, once they found them, they're just like, oh, this is amazing. But it, but it wasn't easy to find an integrator and then really know how to help them thrive in that position. So I want to dive into like what you're doing with that, but I want to let's take a step back 
And, you know, there's a why we want, you know, the, to run businesses, visionaries should have businesses with integrators. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, you and I both value is, is not working in the business and removing ourselves from, from the day to day. So we can either build more businesses or do things that are important to us, whether it's, it's just different passions or things that we find important or it's family. I know family is important to you. So, so what are the, some of the things that you like, you know, the, the reasons why you remove yourself from the business? Like what are the, some of those things for you? Yeah. So I have, you know, a family, I'm a new dad. So we're nine months into it now. Right. So I used to be able to work all the time and now I don't want to work nearly as much as I used to because I enjoy spending time with my wife and, and little daughter. So um, I think that's important. I have passions outside of business, friends, family, sports, all that kind of stuff. I got a nonprofit college baseball ministry that I run. So yeah, business can't be, you know, everything, but sometimes it is if you don't have a team around you that you could trust to get the job done when you're not there. And that was it for me. I mean, I remember missing people's weddings, friends of mine that I'm like, I can't go back home to Indiana. I live in Georgia now, but I'm like, I can't take two days off because if I don't, nobody's answering the phone. Nobody's following up with the leads. So you have to build a business that serves your life rather than you serving your business. And the only way to do that is to find other people that you trust that bring in something different to the table that can, that you can delegate things that need to get done. So you, you can focus on the things that are really important. So how do you do that? You're talking to, let's pretend I was somebody that's working in my business. My, my, my life is serving my business. Like you just said, we don't want our lives to serve our business, but my life is serving my business and I want my business to serve my life. How do you help that business owner? We first got to figure out, Eric, what's unique to you? What are the three or four things that only you can do that are the most impactful for your business? So for me, it's, building relationships with people, right? It's coming up with new ideas and it's giving the people that I have the resources they need to be successful. So if I'm doing anything out of that, I got to really ask myself why. So it's figuring out what's unique to you. What are the things that add most value to your business? Is it closing big deals? Is it having big relationships? Is it coming up with new ideas? What are those things that are unique to you that only you can do that you cannot delegate to somebody else? Is it producing content that you can send off into the world and that content gets people to click on your website, right? What is it? So it's first that find out what's unique to you and only you can do. And then add, then start making a list of all the other things that you do once a day, once a week, once a month that you don't necessarily want to do that. You're like, you know what? I don't want to do this. It's not really adding a ton of value to the business. And if I could replace doing this with more of whatever those things are that are unique to you, you're going to be better off. And then it's just starting writing a, a few things down each quarter that you want to delegate. If you're managing the finances or doing the books, you don't want to do it. Write it down. Find a CFO. They might be better at the job than you. Uh, they might like doing it more because I find if I do stuff, but I don't like it, I'm going to get burnt out. So find the things that are unique to you. Find the things that you're doing today that you don't want to do 90 days from now. And then start figuring out, okay, who can do this job, whether it's somebody already in an organization or you need to bring somebody else in. And what I realize is if you can start delegating things, that gives you more time. If you have more time, you could focus on growing your business. You focus on growing your business, you make more money. You make more money, you can afford those people to do those jobs. But what I find is a lot of people don't want to invest in people. And that's the biggest thing that prevents these business owners from getting out of their business. They don't want to write a check to hire great people. Hey, I can find a VA and wherever and pay him 12 bucks an hour to do stuff like hire great people, invest in great people, incentivize them. So the more successful the business is, the more they make and they'll be, in, you'll be in good shape. I like it, the, just the term investing in people, invest into great people. Um, Cause a lot of times we just see that as an expense a payroll as an expense versus an investment. And it's easy to do. I get caught up in, into that. Caleb's over here. I'm looking at him right now. That was a good investment I made right there. And, um, but we, Caleb and I, who produces the show and does so many things for me, we started to look at him like, what are the things that you hate doing? 
And this is basically what it, what it was, Casey. Like, let's look at all of our emails and we look back at the emails that don't get answered or they should have been answered three weeks ago. Those are the things that we hate doing. So how can we find somebody that can do those things? And we actually found somebody that loves doing the things that we hate. Like she loves all the administrative repetitive tasks and, and like she's fired up with that where we are not. So I, I love that. What are the easiest things for people to offload? First, first, like first things, a put your go back to your franchise days as a franchisee. What are the first things that a franchisee should offload to somebody else? I think some of the stuff you do in your personal life. So I told you before we got in this call, we had a giant tree fall in our front yard. Well, normally I'd be like, okay, well, I got to call four different tree companies and I got to get three different quotes. All I did is I took a video of it and I said, hey, look, Crystal, who's our operations leader, I said, look what happened. You know where I live. I need you to bring me three different quotes to fix this project. It took me a minute. She brought me three different quotes. I said, all right, here it is. Let me call this guy. Let me negotiate him a little bit, right? Let me see if I can get a better deal because that's my unique ability. And then he <laughs> gave me a better deal. We set up a time and then we're good. So like literally that was a personal thing that I can delegate. So I like to delegate anything in my personal life. So I just like to make a list of anything and everything that I can possibly delegate on the personal side of things, which that allows me more time to spend time with my wife and daughter rather than calling four or five different companies to try to get a, get this tree out of our yard. Um, and then on the franchise thing, it's, gosh, I mean, just running a business. I, I remember answering all the phones and I'm like, well, I got to be the one to answer every call because that's a customer. But it was, okay, well, let me detail and document how to answer that call and what to do and how to handle it if there's an issue. And if they say they don't want to buy or sign up, like, well, how to, how to, you know, have a rebuttal so you can get them to say yes. Cause I was like, I'm the only one that can answer that call and nobody's going to do it better. And was it true? Yeah, I think it actually was. Cause I'm really good at sales. I'm really good at building relationships with people and creating value. But I was like, all right, if I am the only one that can answer phones, I'm never going to be able to go find strategic partnerships. So I taught people how to do it. And I realized that, look, if they do it a nine out of 10 or eight out of 10, that's perfectly fine. That gives me more time to go focus on creating partnerships with other organizations that could bring more phone calls. And I realized my job is to bring in a hundred phone calls and then get answered nine out of 10 or eight out of 10, rather than just have 20 phone calls and they get answered a 10 out of 10. So it's just pretty much anything that I'm doing that I think I can train somebody else to do 80% as good as I ever could. And then figuring out the things that I'm just not great at that I need to bring an expert in. I'm not great at financials. I need to bring a CFO in. I need to bring a bookkeeper in. And that, those are the things that I started with. I think those things are easier when you're not good at something and you can hire that out. But I love what you said. You know, you were good at the sales, the phone calls and, and with the customers. And you know that you're going to delegate that and it's not going to be done as well, but you were better at bringing in more leads and more people to get higher and, and more revenue. But what's the roadblock? I mean, it sounds so obvious when someone's listening, they're like, yeah, that makes more sense, but they're gonna probably be here a year from now and not have delegated. What's the, what is the thing that helps somebody to actually start taking action or is it just action takers take action and, and people that are not uh, people that are not really entrepreneurial, they're just going to own the business or the business is going to own them. Like, like what is it that causes people to take action and others just to stay stuck? I had to remove myself and my own identity from the success and performance of the business. I had to realize the business is the business, but it's not who I am mm -hmm. because I wanted the business to be perfect in all things. Like if I had a friend that came and joined, like I wanted everything to be perfect. But what I had to realize is when you go to any restaurant or any other business, it's not perfect there, right? So why do I expect it to be perfect at our business? So I had to realize that if everything's not 100% perfect, done 100% awesome all the time, like it's okay. A nine out of 10 is okay because no business operates perfectly. So that's what I had to do. And then say, you know what? It's okay if not everything's okay all the time. And that's just part of the game. And if somebody makes a mistake, I'm okay with it. We learn from it and we improve. And early on, I was really hard on my people. And if it was not excellent all the time, I told them, 
and they burn out and they would work really hard for six months, but then I had to replace, replace them. And then I'd have to train somebody else. So that was what was really important. I mean, there's that book, good to great. Like, yeah, I think we all want to be good to great, but I'm like, I just want to run a good business. I want to run a good business. I don't want to have to just live and breathe and die, you know, die over this thing to make it perfect and great all the time. So that, that helped me a little bit. And I still fight that every day because I want to be excellent at all I do, but I got to realize that good is good enough sometimes. How do you do that? How do you do that? Or what did you learn on managing people and helping and knowing that they're going to be an eight out of 10 and not a 10 out of 10 and you being okay with that and you helping them helping them be the best that they can be, but knowing they're not going to be as good as you at it. Like, was it a mental thing that you had to just get over or were there things that, um, like how, how did you become okay with a, with an eight out of 10 versus a 10 out of 10? I'm still never okay with it, <laughs> but I just realized that's the reality that we have that as a business owner, they're not going to care about it as much as you do. Um, because if they did, they would be the business owner. Um, now I wanted to find people that one day wanted to own a business because I thought those are the people that I could really promote and really give opportunities to. And that's what we did in our business. I found our top players and I really, you know, trained them, taught them, um, you know, helped them become the best version of themselves. And they eventually left me, right. Which was great because they went and started their own business, which was awesome. So we had three of our top employees went and started their own franchises from our, us, which was amazing and awesome. So, I mean, I don't think I'm ever okay with it being an eight out of 10, but what I'm more important and more focused on is being a great husband. And I realize that if I'm at the office at midnight, trying to figure this thing out, like I'm not going to have the energy for my family. So I just want to run a really good business that makes an impact in people's lives. I want to give people opportunities to grow personally and professionally. And I think if you do that in a business, give your employees opportunities to grow as a, as people teach them to win at work, but also teach them to win at home. And if you give them opportunities to grow professionally as well, and, you know, tie them, tie in some incentives and all that kind of stuff, you'll be in good shape. I like that. And I've had, I've seen a number of comments in the franchise secrets, Facebook group about how do you help employees grow personally? Like what are some of the things that you've done that you've seen success with in, in de helping your employees develop as a better man, as a better woman, yeah. better father, yeah, we just like to ask the question, like, what does success look like? Let's say me and you are sitting here talking in three years from today. Like, what has to happen for you to be, you know, happy with your professional progress and your personal progress? Like, what does that look like? Like, paint me a picture three years from today. What has to happen? What's life look like at home where you're happy, where you're fulfilled? And what's life look like at work? And we do that in the interview process because I want to make sure what they want personally and what they want professionally is going to line up with what we need. Because if we can help people get what they want, we're going to get what, what we want. But if what they want isn't something we can provide and get for them, we're not going to let them work here. So if they want to come in and learn and grow and make X amount of dollars and we have that path, we give that to them. And then we just give them tools and resources. We might, we might have a book club where, uh, we read, I think it was John Maxwell's How Successful People Think. And it's like, hey, does anybody want to do a book club? We're going to read this book over the next 12 weeks. We're going to meet a couple times. We're going to go to Top Golf. We're going to sit around and talk about it, eat some hors d'oeuvres, hit some golf balls. Like, what'd you learn and how are you going to apply it at home and at work? And if we do that, people are pretty fired up and they're learning and they're better people and they're better employees. So you've, you mentioned a couple of times, um, home and at work and tying and, and tying that in. There's some employees, they just, I guess you do it through in the interview process. You see if they really have those, those goals personally. And so, you know, that they have those personal goals, but do you have some employees that just, they just don't care. And they're just there as an employee. Yeah. Hopefully we've weeded them out before bringing them on. Um, because we have that culture and we have that culture now where, um, you know, we want people that are wanting to be the best version of themselves. Yeah. So in the interview process and really the, the, I guess the, uh, the reference process, we really make sure and we go deep of who are these people, right? We used to interview and uh, hire a lot of former baseball players, professional and college baseball players. We would go and try to find their coach. We would try to find all of their people and be like, who are we really getting here? Mm -hmm. 
What do they really want? What were they like as a player? Did they want to be the best one? Were they the first one on the field and the last one off? Were they a hustler? Did they work hard? Did they want to be the best or not? And if they did, then they'd work out really well here. And when we interviewed people and their references, we would tell their people, look, I'm not going to share this with them. But honestly, this job is only going to work for them if they wake up every day and want to be the best version of themselves. Did they do that in their previous job? Because be honest, I won't tell them if they're not it, but like they're going to hate it here. And I know you don't want them to hate their job. And that's what we try to get before we even make a hire. So when you say they're going to hate it here, it's they're going to hate the culture of everybody that's around them that does want to be the best version of themselves. That's why they're going to hate it, right? 100%. Yeah, because people want to be surrounded with like-minded people. And if you jump on a team and everybody's like working hard and playing hard and wanting to be the best version of themselves, and these people just want to check in and check out and go home, right? And they don't want to strive and learn and be challenged. Like they won't, they won't want to work in that type of environment. So are there certain roles that that wouldn't work with? Think about a minimum wage position. Like in my mind, I think they can still be the best version of themselves. It doesn't, it's not an, an income level. It's a mindset, but where, where do you see challenges with that philosophy or that culture in, in other businesses or is there? Yeah, no, I think there is because there are those roles for the people that, Hey, they want to show up at nine. They want to leave at five. They want to, you know, just do their job and leave. Um, I, I don't work with a lot of those because that wouldn't be a type of business that I would want to be in or be involved in uh, because I want to work with opportunities and businesses that have upside for their people. And I only want to be involved in those type of businesses. I mean, it's just, it's just hard, but you're right. There are those roles for people. It's not something that I love to work in because I'm always wanting to be about organization and companies that are all about promoting people um, from the lowest level to the highest level. We want to give people a path to grow um, and it doesn't matter the job. So you're still going to be like, think about this as a business owner. They're, they're thinking, oh my gosh, my business, I have um, minimum wage employees and they're not wanting to be the best versions of the, of themselves. But in a business you're dealing with people period, whether they're employees or customers, you can't control every person that walks into your business. So you're going to be dealing with certain types of people or your key people, your key employees are going to be dealing with them. So it might be a culture or you can have that best version of themselves culture in your management team or your leadership team or your sales team. And they might be managing other people and, and helping them, but they may not be at that same level of wanting to be the best version of themselves. But I would imagine most businesses, you're able to do that at least within your leadership team. 100%, that's where it starts. You have to get that buy-in with your leadership team and hopefully it trickles down. And, uh, but no, you're, you're, you're spot on there with your feedback. So what are some resource, some of the favorite resources that you, the people that you've worked with or your own teams have found? You said the, the John Maxwell book, are there certain books or podcasts or, or resources that your teams have really loved? So it starts at the top, right? So rocket fuel is obviously it because you have to have a, a really healthy visionary integrator duo. If you're a visionary and you're the idea person, but you don't have the person to manage the people, the processes, do all the stuff, like find that person and then invest in that relationship. So reading that book, if you're a visionary, if you're the owner of any business, read it. Just read the first chapter, email me, I'll send it to you for free. And then if you do have that integrator, invest in your relationship there. And our company, Legacy 412, was formed from a, from a verse in the book of Ecclesiastes where it talks about a core to three strands is not easily broken. So you got the visionary, you got the integrator, and oftentimes it takes that third strand to come in here and make sure that visionary integrator relationship is strong, right? Um, and if that's strong, then every other relationship in the business is gonna be good. So start there. And then on the leadership team level, it's all about leadership and management. If you lead people well and you manage people well, you create a culture of accountability. And there's a book out there called How to Be a Great Boss, another EOS type book. And it's it's very simple. People will actually read it. You can read it an hour and a half, two hours. And that's the best book for leadership um, and management throughout your entire organization. So those two resources are the best. 
I think Caleb just ordered that book for me on Amazon, if I'm not mistaken. He heard you and he ordered it. So uh, we'll see. But I haven't I haven't heard of that book, but um, I'll get that and read that. I love smaller books like Rocket Fuel and, and whatnot. Give me some. I want to go into Legacy 412. I want to dive into that a little bit more. But but before that, what's it? So Mark wrote that book, Rocket Fuel, and you worked with him. What is it? And he's a visionary. What's it like? Give me some examples of him or your relationship with him where you just saw like this is a visionary through and through. Like, like what did you notice about him that was so visionary? And what did you admire about that? Yeah. I mean, he knew what he was great at. He said there was three things that he should do. He should learn new things, create content, and deliver that content to our target market. And we had to handle everything else. Uh, how to turn that stuff into revenue, how to turn that revenue into people that are happy, happy they actually bought it. Um, and they not only are they happy they actually bought it, but they referred it out to other people. So he just knew what he was great at and he was really self-aware. And then, you know, my job was to make sure the majority of his time was spent doing those things throughout the week and then handling everything else on the back end. Do you think there's ever um, imposter syndrome? It's like, I'm only good at these three things. I think I should be good at something else, or I think I should be good at some, you know, as a visionary, you know, I've seen different visionaries. I've had conversation with them and I, and I see imposter syndrome uh, creep up and, or is it just that they're so, they know, they see the value in that, or maybe it's imposter syndrome until they see the value and they've had that validated with the right team that they're able just to pour rocket fuel on that. Like, what have you seen with all of that? I know there's a lot jarbled up there. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's just trying to figure out what actually moves the needle in your business. I mean, we're all in business to make money and make an impact. And I love making money because it gives us opportunities to give that money away, to invest that money in our people. So it's really as a visionary, it's figuring out what do I do that really moves the needle? What do I do that makes the company more money? And then figuring out, okay, well, how do I do more of that stuff? And then what are the stuff I do that distracts me from doing those things. Well, we both like to make money. We both like to invest money. We've had conversations on investing money and we both like to give money. I just uh, got off a conversation with someone that is in, I think he might be in Ukraine right now. He's going from Poland into Ukraine. That was about two hours ago. He said he was going to be in there, but he's um, working with a group that I help him connect with. That's really rescuing orphans out of Ukraine and and uh, helping prevent child trafficking that's happening in a major way right now with the, with the war that's happening. So like I'm getting ready to, to give more money to that. And one of the things that I'm realizing is I have this influence with franchisees, franchisors, investors, and I want to get word out there of places to be able to give money where it's not being used for a lot of admin stuff. It's going straight to the need. So it, I've never really talked about this type of thing on the podcast, but I know like your background, like what are the areas that you like to give? Where do you like to invest in charities? Yeah. So I think the best place to invest is your own time. Cause that's the most valuable. Anytime you're spending your own time, it's the most valuable. But then I think once again, it's figuring out what's your unique ability and how can you use that to either start your own thing or help something else. So the way that I look at it is if you want to make an impact, like what keeps you up at night? Like what brings tears to your eyes, right? Like what, what breaks your heart? And then that's where I like to get behind things that break my heart because it's like, man, that, that really hurts. And that's what I got in. So I got in a college baseball ministry because it broke my heart that I was an 18 to 22 year old kid that played college baseball that was lost as could be. And nobody was there to help. Nobody was there to ask me how I was really doing. And then seeing other people go through that, it broke my heart. And then I invested my time, but now I'm investing my resources, which is connecting with people, sharing the vision with people and raising money to help more people do that. So that's the way that I've looked at it. And I think everybody should have something outside of their work and outside of their family that they're invested in to help. But I'll say this, the most important thing you can do is have a great house and a great home and a great family. So invest your time there first before doing anything else. I love that. And it's easy to be caught up in doing in saving the world and when your own 
house is on fire or things aren't short up there. So I, I love that. All right. Let's talk about legacy 412. Like, what is that? You, you, you dove into it a little bit, but let's go deeper into that and how, like what you're doing today and how you're helping businesses. Sure. Yeah. So our whole, you know, our focus is helping business owners remove themselves from the day to day. So, you know, our typical company has anywhere from five to 50 employees typically. Um, and it's a business owner and they're growth minded. They want to build their business out, but they're stuck doing all the day in day out stuff to just run the business. But they're like, I have a bigger vision. I have a bigger mission. I don't want to do all this stuff. I want to focus on the three or four things I want to do. And I need people to help me get out of the weeds so I can do what only I can do. And then we help by first talking to the visionary and really developing what is your vision for the business? And then what is your vision for your life? Because you don't want to build a business that doesn't align with the vision you have for your life. And I find that a lot of visionaries don't really have a clear vision. They have all kinds of ideas and vision, but it's not very specific. So we help visionaries first understand where do they want to go as a business? Will that success get them what they want at home? Okay. And then what are the resources and tools you need to be successful? And what are the obstacles and the biggest challenges that you have to make that vision reality? And then we give the tools and resources that we've used in our own business to help them get what they want. Because I think a lot of like advisors, coaches, consultants, they haven't actually been in the shoes of the people they're working with. And it would be like hiring a golf swing instructor to fix your baseball swing. Like they don't know how to hit a baseball because they've never done it. And they know how to swing, but they're swinging something that's just different. So what makes us unique is like we've been in the shoes of these business owners that have it all on the line and they want to create and they want to get out of the day to day. So that's where we start. What's your vision? Does it align? What are the resources and, and, and tools you need to be successful? But what are the issues that you're currently experiencing? How do we help you solve those issues to get you more time back? Because we believe if we can get you more time, you can invest that time to grow, scale, build your business and take advantage of all the opportunities that are out there. So what does a vision that is not clear look like? And what does a clear vision look like? Cause you said most people come with a vision that's not super clear and then you help them clarify that. So can you give me an example of an unclear vision and then what a good clear vision's like after you've worked your magic? Yeah. So first it's written down. So you gotta, you gotta write it down and it's probably tested and looked at by a couple other people that say, you know what, that makes sense. That's attainable. So write it down, work with a couple people that say, you know what, that, that makes sense. If you do that, like that would be amazing. And I believe that's actually going to get you what you ultimately want out of your life. And then is it attainable? Is it realistic? So first write it down, clarify it, run it by a couple people that you trust. And I feel like a lot of people don't really do that and they don't have an attainable vision. So, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of just examples of what we have. I, I think it's got to be measurable. you got to be able to measure it. It's got to be very specific and it's got to be attainable. And if you can do that, it's a smart goal. And they talk about that a little bit, um, you know, regarding smart goals around got to be very specific, very measurable very attainable. Like we want to have five locations. Okay. You want to have five locations where, what locations, how much revenue do those businesses make? What is the profit of those businesses? How many employees do you have? Like that's where you got to get really deep and really specific. And I feel a lot of visionaries, it's hard for them to get there because they don't know the questions to ask of themselves. And it's more fun just doing a bunch of stuff than actually sitting there and planning. And the planning is the hardest part, but you have to have the right plan because without the right plan, you're not going to get, you know, that ultimate vision. So do they need to work with an integrator on that? Or is that where they need to hire the integrator? Or is that where they need to hire you to hire an integrator to <laughs> work it all out? Yeah, I mean, an integrator is going to help execute the plan, but without the right plan, it's not going to really get you there. Um, so that's where we start. We, we spend just a few hours with people and ask ask our clients really good open-ended questions. We get all that data and then we, we work into a session. Okay. All right. Well, I think this is your vision. Let's go deeper there. Let's get a little bit more specific. How are we going to measure that? And then I ask them, okay, what are the biggest things preventing you from getting there? 
because you have to start there because if you just jump in with an integrator, but there's not a clear vision, the integrator is not going to know exactly what to do and how to do it. And you're not going to align. So whether you're a visionary without an integrator, you got to clear the vision. And if you already have an integrator, you got to make sure you're on the same page. And I see a lot of visionaries integrators are not on the same page regarding what is the vision and then what's the best way to get there. Because what I find is you got the three-year vision, but it's okay, what are the next steps we need to do in the next 90 days? And I find a lot of business owners do the, do the right things, but they do them in the wrong order. Because hmm. if you do the right things, but if you don't do them in the right order, it doesn't really matter. And you're actually putting the cart before the horse. So what are those, some, what are some of the right things in the wrong order? What have you seen? Uh, let's see. So working on a, another business right now where um, we've already built or they've already built a website, they're building it out, but the messaging isn't unique enough. Like it's not going to resonate because it's too broad and it's too vague. Right. So it's like, hang on, before you do anything, you really need to know, like, who is your target market? They don't really know specific enough. And then I'm like, what is the message to the target market that's going to get them excited? So that's just one example. It's probably a bad example, but. No, I think that's a pretty good example because I would say there's so many business owners out there that franchises out there that don't know their target market. They don't know their target market for franchisees. They don't know their target market for their customer. And if you know your target market and you've asked yourselves the right questions with that, then you know how to market to them. But if you don't know their pains and, and their aspirations and their goals, and you don't ask the right questions to get them versus just saying, what are their goals? You need to find out emotionally what it is. There's good questions to ask to be able to get to some of that stuff. You don't know how to market to them. So you could just say, we want franchisees or we want people that at, want acai bowls or whatever the, or that want to be fit. There's, you can go deeper and niche down into your target market. And I've just seen so many business owners and franchisors that just, they don't want to do that because they want, they don't want to miss out on a possible lead. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, early on in our business, so we owned a franchise called DBAT Baseball and Softball Academy. It was a baseball and softball academy. So baseball and softball, that's really wide. That's really vague. And it's like, well, who's our target market? It's baseball players. Well, that's like a lot of people. We had to narrow it down. Okay, well, is it men's league? Is it professional baseball players? Is it this age group or that age group? And we niched it down to five to 12 year olds. And then we even niched it down to five to eight year olds. Why five to eight year olds? Because they were frankly the most fun to work with. We enjoyed <laughs> working with them and they generated us most revenue. The five to eight year olds, moms cannot say no to a five or eight year old. Hey mom, can I have this? Mom, can I do this camp? <laughs> Like they can't say no, but by the time they're like 10, 11, 12, especially they're teenagers, the parents are like, no, you're not doing that. You can't do that. But like we made the most money off of them. Okay. They had the most fun and we had the most fun serving them. But in order to find our target market, I mean, it was, we had to really get specific and we had to really niche down. And then our niche over the competition was, Hey, look, you're going to have fun and you're going to learn something new. And that was our thing, which the competition was going to try to make all of these baseball players, you know, major league baseball players when all the moms wanted, right. Was that make sure they had fun, but the dads wanted them to like learn something new. So we hit <laughs> what our target market wanted. We had more fun than anything doing it. We didn't have to deal with a bunch of teenage kids, right. That thought they were going to be the next MLB player. And they didn't even need help because they had it all going on anyway. And they weren't going to pay for <laughs> private instruction. So I think, yeah, I don't think a lot of business owners really know who their target market is. How are they actually going to prove that they're unique above the competition? Because if you don't do that, you're selling a commodity yep. um, and then making sure the vision is realistic and attainable. Dude, I love that. I'm dealing, I'm doing that with my franchisors in my franchise or mastermind, helping them with franchise development. And that's the first thing that we're doing going into the target market. I'm taking them through multiple exercises to be able to do that. And once you do that the right way, you ask yourselves the right questions and the right follow-up questions when you're not really thinking about an ideal avatar or ideal customer, you come up with things that, that, um, they're going to help you in your, like you said, marketing material, your copy, your just so many different things. So it sounds so simple, but I heard you get fired up. You're like, wait a second. Yeah, this is how we niche down in the baseball market.
And like, that's amazing niching down to that much. And even just, uh, you know, having fun and learning something new. So what are we missing? What haven't we talked about that you think the audience of franchisors, franchisees, and franchise buyers should know about the visionary integrator role before we wrap up and I let you uh, get back to your family? Look, probably a hundred different things, but at the end of the day, only a few things really matter. Right. And I think that's the toughest thing for any business owner is to focus on the 20% of this conversation that you think will make the biggest impact. I would say, listen to this again, make sure when you listen to it, write down whatever you learn and then take action on one or two of those things. But what I would probably say, if you're a business owner, if you're that visionary, that idea person, you're seeing it out there, you need to have an integrator that can help you execute that plan. If you already have an integrator, invest in that relationship, get that third core. Get that person that could come in and make sure your relationship is strong. They're asking the right questions of your relationship. Um, you know, ask your integrator, how am I doing? How am I really doing? How can I improve? How am I making your life harder than it needs to be? Give me some feedback. So I think visionaries asking for feedback from other people on the team is really important. Um, and then just focusing, having a plan, having it written down, having it vetted by certain people, and then making sure you have somebody on your advisory board or in your corner that's already done something similar that, you, that you're looking to do. Because if you want to go build a $10 million business, have somebody on your team that's already done it. Have somebody that's already walked the path that you're about to walk on your team that you could call that, that, that can ask you the tough questions. And I think a lot of visionaries don't have that. And they don't like being asked tough questions. So just be open-minded and be willing to get feedback from other people that have been there and done that. I, you, you mentioned something that I have to ask, um, advisory board. What have you, cause I'm, I'm getting ready to be on some advisory boards and having advisory shares and, and whatnot. What have you seen the value in companies that have advisory boards? Yeah. So I think it depends on the size, but I think it's just other people that can challenge what you're currently doing ask tough questions um, and bring some kind of unique skill set to the equation. So don't have four marketing people on your advisory board, like have one or two, right? Uh, you know, have people that are great at raising money on your advisory board, but don't have all six people. So just have, you know, if you look at your business, you got sales, you got marketing, you got operations, you got finance, you probably want to mix up the advisory board with people that are an expert in each of those groups, but make sure you have somebody on your advisory board that's already built something that's been part of it, that's been an owner of what you want to eventually build because they've walked the journey and they'll be able to help you, you know, avoid some pitfalls that you might not know exist because they've already been there. Love it. Great advice. Casey, thanks for coming on, dropping some wisdom. How can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. Just go to caseycavell.com, C A S E Y. C-A-V-E-L-L.com. You can learn more about our company, Legacy 412, um, and all the other things that we do. So yeah, caseycavell.com. You go to our website, also at Legacy, and then just jump on a call with me. If you have questions, ideas, if you're a business owner, I want to help you. Free call. I want to get to know your story, get to know where you're wanting to go, and I'll give you some tools and resources that have helped me free of charge. Thanks a bunch, man. All right. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.